Welcome everybody to webinar nine in the Inclusive Martial Arts webinar series. My name is Ashlyn Clardy. I work at the UNESCO Chair in Inclusive Physical Education, uh, Recreation, Sport and Fitness. And this webinar series is being brought to you by the UNESCO ICM, which is the International Centre of Martial Arts for Youth Development and Engagement in South Korea. So as I said, this is webinar nine and the theme of which is the inclusion of women and girls in martial arts. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be with you here today. We have an expert, a fantastic um, panel of experts from various domains and that have a lot of expertise and experience in on the topic of gender inclusion or the inclusion of women and girls in martial arts. And so to start, we I'm going to give a very uh, and I'll introduce each of our panelists and then we'll be moving into some three very distinct topics. So the topics they're going to be covering today are one, the recruitment and retention, two, coaching women and girls, and then three, pathways for women in leadership. And so to start our first panelists, and in, not in any particular order, the order of how I'm seeing them here on my screen. So we have Dr. Anna Kavura. She is a sports psychology specialist and postdoctoral fellow at the School of Sport and Health Science at the University of Brighton. Then we have Dr. Anne Chundo, a national champion in women's boxing and associate professor of sports sociology at Nord University in Norway. We have Dr. Chloe McLean, a national karate champion and lecturer in sociology at the University of West Scotland. And last but absolutely not least, we have Dr. Alex Channon, who is a principal lecturer in physical education and sports studies at the University of Brighton. So welcome to all of our panelists. We're so thrilled that you said yes to joining us here and to share your expertise. I also want to welcome all of our attendees that are there with, here with us live today, but also all of those who are listening to the recording these recordings are going to be available on the UNESCO Chair's uh, YouTube channel, as well as UNESCO ICM's YouTube channel as well. And so let's start and hear a little bit more about each of our panelists. So Dr. Kavora, can you share a little bit more about yourself and your expertise, please? Hi, yeah, thank you. Thank you Ashton, for, the, for the introduction and for the invitation to participate in this. This is very exciting. If I can, uh, regarding my martial arts uh, experience, if I can say like a little bit more, I guess I identify as a martial arts enthusiast and I have tried many different uh, disciplines over the year, over the years, but my main sport, I guess it's Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, in which I hold like a black belt that I have been doing it for more than 15 years. And uh, also Judo, I have been doing for several years and um, till I reached the brown belt, uh, level and my research interests are very much uh, connected my research interest on gender is very much connected with my uh, personal experiences of training like uh, instructing and competing in like uh, martial arts spaces that are usually dominated by men and uh, also like informed by uh, my experiences as a Greek woman traveling around, like I have been living in like countries like Finland, Denmark, uh, South Korea for a while and Brazil and UK. So I had to uh, adapt to many different like uh, ways of, uh, of uh, organizing martial arts and but also of like uh, different uh, cultural understandings in relation to my uh, gender and uh, sport. So my views on uh, inclusion and inclusion of girls and uh, women are very much informed from this cultural lens. Thank you, Dr. Kavura. And it's lovely to have you with us. We look, I look forward to hearing more from you. And so Dr. Chindal, can you share a little bit more about us, about yourself, I should say, and your expertise and personal experience? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, I always say that uh, I was a boxer before I became a researcher. So uh, I started boxing when I was 16 years old and uh, I just fell in love with the sport. Uh, so I don't really have much experience with other martial arts. I did try kickboxing for a little while, but uh, boxing uh, is the sport uh, that, that that's where my passion is. Uh, so uh, 
uh, yeah, I, I boxed on the national team for a few years, became a national champion, uh, and uh, slowly, as my uh, career in uh, university uh, started to take off, I uh, started to scale down the boxing and transition into leadership. So uh, I'm currently the head coach uh, of um, something called Norway Female Box, which is uh, the women and girls inclusion program for uh, for uh, the Norwegian Boxing Federation. I'm uh, the current vice president of the Norwegian Boxing Federation as the first woman uh, and the youngest ever to hold the position. And I just got elected into the coaching committee in the International Boxing Federation. So uh, I have quite a bit of experience with uh, leadership uh, in, in different areas. Um, uh, yeah, so I guess that would be, uh, as of now, my perspectives are mainly the, the coach and uh, more the, the leadership aspect of, uh, of martial arts. Fantastic, Dr. Chandel. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'm really looking forward to hearing a lot more about the pathways for women in leadership that you're going to share about uh, shortly. And Dr. Chloe McLean, welcome. Hi, thanks very much for having me here today um, and thanks for the really kind introduction. So I've been doing karate for nearly 25 years now. Um, I now currently have stopped competing, um, but I have moved on to coaching karate and I'm also a director for women and girls interests for the Scottish Karate Governing Body. In terms of my research on gender in martial arts, most of my research has focused on the sport of karate. And what I'm really interested in is the ways in which practice in martial arts can challenge or reinforce conventional ideas about gender and conventional ways in which we use our bodies in gendered ways um, or how it can challenge those gendered ways that we use our bodies. Um, but really looking forward to being part of this panel today. I think it's going to be really brilliant. Thank you, Dr. Martine. Yeah, me too. It's going to be great. I can hear already. And I'm sure all of our attendees viewing, as I said, live or even watching the recording, you're getting an idea of what we what's in store here, hearing from each of our panelists already so far. And Dr. Channon, can you share a little bit more about yourself and your, your background? Uh, thanks, Ashleen. Yeah, and thank you um, for having me along today. It's it's really a great privilege to uh, join you folks and to be talking about this topic. Uh, so, with respect to my uh, my background, I've been training in martial arts since about two thousand and four. I trained in freestyle kickboxing, in kung fu for uh, quite a few years, uh, karate as well. I tried aikido, and more recently, I've been doing Brazilian jiu jitsu. So, I've trained in a fair few different martial arts and uh, have loved combining like like the, the other panelists combining the uh, practical experience of doing martial arts and being a martial artist with uh, academic research so my first sort of real real foray into social science in sport was looking at gender in martial arts particularly uh, around men and women who train together in martial arts and how uh, as Chloe mentioned you know some of the gendered ways of being and, and living through your body how that um, can in many ways create problems in uh, in martial arts contexts where um, men and women are, are coming up against each other, doing something which they very rarely do um, in, in regular social life, which is uh, punch and kick each other um, purposefully and for fun. So my first study was to try and understand this and, and how people make sense of it and what kind of problems it creates um, when we do this together and how people get around those problems. I've also been very interested in how the media represent martial arts from a gender point of view, particularly how female martial artists and female uh, combat athletes uh, are represented in the media. Uh, and beyond gender, I've also done research on topics like violence and consent, um, consent education and uh, medical care as well, most recently um, in combat sports. So I've got a very broad academic interest in martial arts generally, um, but gender was the first thing that I, that I looked at um, properly. So it's always been quite close to my heart. Um, I'm yeah, really looking forward to the rest of the discussion and I'll, uh, I'll stop my introduction there. Thank you so much, Dr. Channon. I'm so excited, you know, the, as each of you are speaking, I'm getting really excited for this conversation. I know it's gonna be really good. And so I'm also gonna share in the chat, everybody. So the Twitter handles for each of our panelists here, 
Um, and for those of you who are, if you're watching the recording, there'll be a slide at the very, very end where you can access this information as well. And um, what I, I really like what you said there, uh, Dr. Channon, about each of you, you have an, a strong, uh, your own personal experience with martial arts, whichever the martial art it is that you're practicing. And there's even a diversity amongst each of you as well. And then obviously then you're a strong, very strong academic background. You know, you're all very well published as well. And so I, I encourage each of you, our attendees, to check out and, and connect with the panelists and, and follow the work that they're doing, especially if you're interested in this topic. So let us get started in the conversation. So we're going to start, as I said, there's three different topics. And so um, Dr. Cavora is going to start the conversation with topic one on recruitment and retention. So take it away, Dr. Cavora, whenever you're ready. So I'm going to share my screen. I have prepared a few slides. Um, here. And can you see my, my slides? Yes. Yes. Great. So I have the privilege to start this webinar with the topic of uh, uh, recruiting and retaining more women and uh, girls in martial arts and combat sports. And um, Despite incremental increases in the numbers of women and girls who train uh, in martial arts and combat sports, uh, most spaces continue to be dominated by uh, men. So recruiting and retaining women and girls seems to be a persisting challenge. To understand why uh, this is happening, um, Many scholars uh, have uh, looked at the underlying reasons for that, uh, including the speakers today, and uh, focusing on uh, identifying the uh, possible barriers and constraints. Um, and today, uh, we have a growing body of research that, res uh, that uh, um, reveals persisting challenges such as gender stereotypes, for example, um, the belief that uh, the perception that the female body is uh, more fragile and less capable uh, for certain, act certain activities, such as fighting and martial arts. Uh, cultural expectations that are also gendered, like for example, research shows uh, that women are more likely to discontinue their sports uh, or martial arts ca career due to cultural expectations to succeed in other fields of life, such as education, for example, or, or like making a family. Um, uh, women who practice uh, martial arts are also constrained by gender hierarchies and unequal distribution of power and resources, um, as identities and characteristics that are seen as male and masculine are more celebrated in martial arts and are offered more respect, uh, space and resources. And uh, of course, this leads to a lack of opportunities for women. Uh, for example, it is harder uh, for women to imagine a professional, a professional career in martial arts as athletes uh, or coaches than it is for men. It might be also harder to find suitable training partners and high level uh, coaching. And let's not forget that it is only like uh, a few decades ago uh, that women have been allowed access to the highest uh, level of martial arts, for example, in the Olympic Games for, the, for those disciplines that are in the Olympic uh, program. So in turn, uh, this also leads to a lack of representation, lack of uh, female role models, and a lack of media coverage. And when female uh, martial artists are presented in the media, their bodies and experiences are often trivialized or even uh, sexualized. Uh, moreover, uh, research based on interviews with female martial artists uh, reveals experiences of interpersonal or institutional discrimination and uh, harassment and sexism in their everyday martial arts practices. And uh, while this is not an exhaustive list of uh, barriers, uh, I think it is important to take these issues into consideration. Uh, when planning our recruitment and retention strategies. It is important to consider, for example, which of the aforementioned barriers or other barriers that might not be included in my list 
uh, might be relevant uh, to the underrepresentation of women and girls in our martial art context, in our national context, in our federation, or in our uh, club culture. Is there anything that could be done in the federation level or in the club level or in our every like day-to-day -day practices in order to tackle these issues? Uh, identifying and addressing the specific issues that may be hurting our clubs or federations ability uh, to recruit and retain women and girls is an important uh, first step. Because the truth is uh, that when it comes to recruitment and retention, there is no one size fits all uh, recipe that would work for, work for all. So our strategies, policies or interventions uh, need to take into account the specific needs uh, that are relevant in our cultural context. And in my next and last slide, uh, I have listed a few examples of strategies that I have uh, seen over the years uh, being used in um, various clubs that I have trained or researched. And, um, however, as I said, um, there is no uh, magic recipe really so everything needs to be adapted to the specifics of the context and something that works for uh, one club might not work for another at all. So I just offer these examples uh, as ideas to consider. And uh, the first one, like one very popular strategy that I have seen in many uh, clubs is uh, women's only uh, training. And that I could be talking for hours about the advantages and disadvantages uh, of these strategies because I have, uh, um, in addition to my research, I have been myself involved in uh, several such initiatives. Uh, but um, just in short, um, I would like to say that um, I have seen women's only classes being a success in recruitment and retention when the idea is not to separate women from men but instead it is to offer this as a first step uh, for, for women's integration into the mixed gender training until, for example, they get used to the contact and the techniques of the sport in an environment that uh, they feel uh, safe, and, uh, or to offer more training opportunities for the higher level practitioners uh, for example, in women-only training camps, it is easier to find partners of the same weight category, and possibly you can prepare better for competition if you if you compete. So the idea is to offer more opportunities for training, uh, not to separate. On the other hand, I have many times seen women's only trainings uh, failing when they are based on gender stereotypes, uh, such as that women are not capable of um, of intense training uh, or of training together with men and they need to be offered some lighter for a form of training or something closer to fitness than to than to fighting but but again it, it really depends on the on the context and uh, such initiatives uh, are more successful when they are run by women themselves or when women are involved uh, in in the decision making and uh, when they are given space in general in their club and in the federation to make decisions, uh, to get involved in the administration, in coaching and uh, leadership duties. Uh, having women in decision-making positions, hiring female coaches and promoting or sponsoring uh, the careers of female athletes can eliminate some of the inequalities and barriers that we discussed before and offer more female role models for other women and girls to look up to. Uh, yet an increase in the numbers of females in positions of power uh, alone is not always enough as we women, women ourselves, uh, we often uh, also end up reproducing gender stereotypes. Uh, so we need education for all those involved uh, in martial arts and combat sports on how to recognize gender inequalities and gender based uh, discrimination and how to prevent and tackle uh, this problem. Uh, we also need education on how to better support the participation and martial arts career development of women and girls, for example, coaching tools 
like um, handbooks and uh, seminars could help. And of course, incorporating a safe sports, poli safe sport policy and uh, making sure that our training environment is free from uh, discrimination, uh, harassment and abuse is a very essential step for retaining and also enhancing the positive experiences of all our pr practitioners. So in closing, I would like um, um, to open the floor for additional uh, comments or questions if our uh, expert uh, speakers have something else to add on this uh, topic. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much for that presentation. And, you know, just before any questions come in there, you know, I'm so present to the similarities, you know, I, my, my background is more in the inclusion of people with disabilities and how, you know, so there's a, the same themes that transcend inclusion is inclusion. And, you know, there's once there is no one size fits all is really, you know, it really is context specific and not even just between one country and another and one culture in that sense. It really can be from one club to another club as well. Um, and there was another point, um, yeah, to really involve the people you want to include, you know, and, and of course, throughout this webinar and, and even in the next um, two topics that we're talking about, we're going to hear a little bit more about that. Thank you so, so thank you so much for that, Dr. Cabora. Any of our panelists have any questions or comments you'd like to jump in with? Yeah, go ahead, just go and uh, just unmute yourself and jump in. Yeah, sure. Sorry, I wasn't sure if you want prefer us to come in and maybe add a couple of things after. But I guess just to say a, a little quick thing about recruiting women and girls as well um, to martial arts. So we know that, for example, that because martial arts have and often are conventionally seen as something which is quite masculine, it's imagined because it's related to fighting, it's imagined to be something that men would do, um, then often before women and girls start martial arts, they need a little bit of reassurance that there's a place for them within that martial arts club, that it's okay for them to do, to do that martial art. And so before getting uh, women and girls to join the club, one thing which can be quite good for martial arts clubs and martial arts coaches to do is to make sure that there's lots of information on a website or a Facebook page for that um, club because research shows that women are much more likely to thoroughly research um, before joining any type of sport. They're much more likely to really research a sport first before joining a club just because they want to, um, it's about reassuring themselves that there's a place for them, that it's okay for women to join that um, sport and to build up their confidence and uh, how comfortable they feel in starting. So um, yeah, just in Anna's presentation there, it just really made me think of that point that women prefer to learn a little bit more about a martial art before joining. So if any of you are coaches, then that's something to consider. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that comment. Go ahead, Dr. Chinda. Yeah, um, I just want to follow up because I think that's a great point. Uh, and I remember it really resonates with my own uh, experiences getting into to boxing. Uh, I remember it was a really simple thing, but in the advertisement in the newspaper, it said, uh, Boxing is a great sport for girls. We we really we have a lot of girls in the club, and we love uh, we love to see girls come for uh, for the boxing school, and and uh, that alone was really uh, helpful for me when I was a teenager and and didn't know anything <laughs> about martial arts or about boxing. So um, sometimes it it can be really small things that uh, can uh, at least get girls to come across the threshold and into the club. And then the real work starts, of course, like uh, Anna highlighted. Mm -hmm. And do you think that this would, you know, this information would probably apply to parents as well of younger children? You know, if, if the parents themselves don't have, aren't inside of the, 
the, the possibility that you know oh martial arts is for their daughters um you know it's probably something as well i know sometimes even in terms of inclusion of people with disabilities it's an issue that sometimes comes up sometimes the parents themselves don't understand the value and the importance of participation for their children with disabilities as well so it's a strategy there as well so do you think it's the same in for when it comes to children or younger girls Yeah, I think so. Sorry, Chloe, I didn't mean to. <laughs> no, I was I was just going to say, I think it can be. Um, so I think parents and young girls can also have the same thoughts as, is this a sport or a type of activity that would be suitable for my daughter? Are they going to enjoy that? Are they going to feel like they stand out? Should a daughter do a martial arts? So I think definitely more information available online or on websites is always going to be useful for parents. Um, but interestingly, sometimes parents can be drawn to martial arts because they have daughters and because, um, so my dad, for example, quite wanted me to do a combat sport because he thought it'd be useful for self-defense. So interestingly, gendered ideas about girls and what we know about violence against women, to be fair, in broader society, sometimes actually because we have daughters, and um, that's sometimes a reason parents want to um, get their children into martial arts as well. Mm, yeah, of course. I'll just say something very briefly on that, Ashley, if that's all right, just to follow on from um, what the others have said with the, the recruitment of women and girls into martial arts, particularly as Chloe mentioned, you know, drawing out gender stereotypes and gendered ways of thinking about uh, what people want from, from activities like this. Uh, one thing to be quite mindful of and be careful of um, for coaches and for other club development uh, officers or, or governing body development officers is how uh, how you go about advertising to women and what kind of information, what kind of images particularly you put on your websites and on your social media to, to advertise to women. Um, and I think I'll come back to representation at the end as, as one of the sort of summary points, because I have a feeling it's going to be uh, a feature later. But um, some of the advertising that I see for some martial arts clubs um, and some of the clubs that, that I've been part of, particularly when I was a student, um, all of the decisions about this were made by men. And the kind of messages they put forward and the images they used of women uh, to put forward clearly were informed by men's views of women rather than women's views of what sport could be and what they would want to, to get out of it. So rather than, um, you know, a website where there's a gallery of, of women just training, just being you know, normal members of a club, there would be images of sort of fitness models in boxing gloves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, oh, martial arts is great for your, for your fitness and you'll look better if you lose weight by doing um, you know, martial arts. And this kind of thing, this kind of messaging, it needs to be very careful because the you, know, you tread too far down this road of, of trying to advertise martial arts as a feminine thing rather than as a thing that's good for women. Um, you know, we, we can run afoul of some problems. And there's, there's quite a lot of research in, uh, in sociology that suggests that women do not respond very well to sexualized images of female athletes or, or airbrushed and glamorized photos. They, they're much more likely to identify with um, and be inspired by images of women actually doing sports. So I think it's very important to think about this when, when we're promoting our clubs, our federations, um, to think about the authenticity of the messages that we're, uh, we're putting forward about what martial arts can be uh, and do for women. Mm -hmm. Great point, absolutely. And that, that was referenced as well, you know, the sexualization that you referenced, um, Dr. Cavara. And I was gonna come back to, you know, you'd mentioned that, um, you know, just some of the things, the issues that might hurt the clubs or the federations, their ability to recruit. Could, would you like to say a little bit more about that, uh, Dr. Cavora? Do you have any examples? You know, sometimes if there's an example or something that people, sometimes you can't see the trees for the forest, if that's an expression you understand, you know, it's, it's you're just doing it the way that you're doing it and it, the way it's always been done. So you're living inside of this paradigm of how it's been done. And then all of a sudden you might, you know, some examples sometimes when you hear, an example of how that some practices that clubs or federations might be doing that are actually impeding inclusion of women and girls. I'm wondering, do you have any examples you could share with the, our audience? I think the example that uh, Dr. Chano just gave about like the messages that we throw in and the way that we promote our, promote our practice was like uh, very to the point that they wanted to follow up uh, on that, that sometimes like uh, the same uh, email
much or the same way of organizing can have different, different, very different effects depending on whether we have reflected on this or not. So like uh, um, something that I, like an example that I often like to use is like the, the use of the color pink. Like, uh, and uh, yeah, Dr. Tsanon and uh, his colleagues have written about that, about the pink gloves. Uh, but uh, the, the use of the color pink. So if we think how to promote, how to promote our activities to women, and uh, we have like men in the decision making only, and we think, oh, what women and girls like pink? Let's make a pink, I don't know, like logo or advertisement uh, picture. Then we just end up like reproducing a stereotype. But if uh, we say that we are women and we are gonna take this co this pink that is like considered, I don't know, like a feminine and not uh, very much linked to fighting, we are going to take this color and take like all these like um, uh, femininity characteristics and like uh, uh, change the meaning and show them that the pink gloves can still give the black eyes coating like uh, Dr. Tsanon and his colleagues uh, again. So I, I'm not sure if I really answered the question that you asked, but I really wanted to, <laughs> to say this ensemble. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Does anybody have any other comments or questions or shall we, are we ready for the next topic? Yeah, so the next topic we have Dr. Chloe McLean coming in. She's gonna speak a little more about coaching women. So take the floor whenever you're ready, Dr. McLean. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I'm just sharing my screen now, so hopefully, hopefully you can see my screen as well now. So thanks very much to Anna for giving us an introduction to recruiting women and girls to martial arts. Now let's look at the next step. Once we've recruited women and girls to our martial arts clubs, how do we go about coaching women and girls? So a first question, which I think is important to address, even if it seems maybe a little bit simplistic, is does sex matter? Does the sex of our participants actually matter for coaching our martial arts? So does the fact of women's biologies and girls' biologies, does that affect our coaching in martial arts or should it affect our coaching? And there's a bit of a yes and a no to this. So mostly, no. Um, mostly because men and women are equally capable of performing the combative moves involved in martial arts and um, they're equally capable of and worthy of learning these moves and of learning self-defense and um, which is the sort of origin of a lot of martial arts it's a self-defense origin and self-defense is something that is promoted as something that everybody should be able to do so in terms of the physical uh, practices within martial arts, women and men are capable of doing it. And unlike some sports, for most martial arts, um, there's a non-gendered criteria of what men and women do within the practice. So what I mean by that is that um, whatever the system is within karate, within judo, within taekwondo, etc., women and men are asked to perform the same moves to receive their next colour of belt, um, that they receive, we're all asked to perform the same techniques. Whereas in some sports, we might think of, for example, gymnastics, um, women are given different activities to do than male gymnasts are given to do. And we can see that in the Olympics competition, that it's different routines that men and women perform. Now, that's not, there isn't actually a sex basis for that, but nonetheless, um, martial arts have non-gendered criteria for what we do. So therefore, um, when women and girls come into our martial arts clubs, there's not an issue there. What is, in terms of biology, what makes a bigger difference um, in terms of uh, practitioners' experiences and how they might train and who they might train with is height and weight. Um, these are often much better indicators of who's going to make a good training partner for us or as a coach who you might want to pair people up with um, it might be more appropriate to do that on a height and a weight basis so what we're saying here is that does women's biological sex matter for practicing martial arts broadly speaking no 
And like I said, okay, there are some ways in which sex does matter for coaching in martial arts and that coaches should be aware of some biological functions of women and girls so that we can enable them and support them to maintain their practice. So first thing that we might want to think about here is menstruation or when women are on their period. So here they're going to bleed for maybe five to seven days, but uh, menstruation doesn't only come with bleeding, it also comes with painful cramps, headaches, fatigue, anxiety, and unfortunately stigma. And there's stigma across most cultures um, to do with menstruation, which means that women and girls and societies more broadly often don't talk about it. It remains taboo and therefore women are encouraged to feel embarrassed when they're experiencing their period or menstruation. And this is damaging in all areas of life for women because this is a natural process which is going to happen to them that they have to deal with but are not allowed to talk to or not not allowed but are stigmatized around talking about but in martial arts it has particular um it can lead to particular difficulties and um, so when women are on their period they might um, experience a little bit of a dip in their performance because they might be experiencing a lot of pain for example so I know people that have fainted because the pain they're experiencing while on their period is extremely sore and so it's useful as a martial arts coach to just be aware that that might be going on in some of the women or girls that you're coaching and so if you see a dip in their performance um, just be aware that it could be in relation to something like a period. Some good practices um, to support women and girls who might be experiencing their period in your martial arts clubs can be simple little things like keeping a sanitary product kit within your first aid kit. So that can mean that should somebody within your class happen to start their period while they're there, it means that they could still continue to do that class that they don't have to turn away and go home or feel that they have to turn away and go home. A lot of martial arts wear a white uniform in which case if there was to be a leak then the blood can show very prominently on the kit and therefore you might want to also think about having a flexible clothing policy which means that um, participants could choose um, to wear things such as leggings or jogging bottoms of a darker colour um, at some of your classes, which again might make women and girls who are experiencing their period feel a little bit more comfortable so that if there was a leak, then it's less visible. So it means that they're more likely to keep attending your class while they're experiencing their period. As some women and girls won't attend a class if they're experiencing their period for these worries about um, period blood showing, and then the worries about how other people might react to that due to the stigma and taboo that is often around periods. And I would say that if you feel comfortable within your own cultural context to do so, it's also good to you know, be vocal that you do have sanitary products in your first aid kit, because that can also normalize periods and normalize talking about periods to your practitioners again making women and girls feel a little bit more comfortable. Menopause is another issue which um, women in their sort of 40s and 50s and maybe their 60s might experience and this can include experiences of hot flushes, headaches, forgetfulness, anxiety and reduced muscle mass and again this can uh, lead to a fluctuate in performance and um, so you might notice that some women have stopped in the middle of their practice because they've forgotten what comes next um, or it might just be that you've seen a little bit of a dip in how well they're performing at certain times this could be due to menopause and so when thinking about how we can support women and girls who are experiencing the menopause uh, women who are experiencing the menopause sorry um, things like opening windows and doors where appropriate can be useful for getting a little bit of fresh air in to help with the hot flushes thinking about supportive rather than punishing forms of um, practice when we see our women and girls uh, dipping in performance because this might be related to the menopause and so it's not that they're not trying but it could be um, a physical issue that they're experiencing at that moment in time 
and another way um, to normalise women's experience, women's bodily experience, might be to promote the benefits of martial arts um, for menopause. So there's a lot of research out there that shows that physical activity can help minimise some of the more negative experiences that women have, some of the negative symptoms of menopause like headaches, hot flushes, etc. It's quite useful to promote and vocally emphasise this to your members because this can, one, help encourage again more members to join or continue their practice, but also to it can help normalise women's bodies within martial arts settings. And the last one I'll touch on here just now as well is eating disorders. So eating disorders can happen to men or women, um, but women doing martial arts are at an increased risk of developing an eating disorder because many martial arts have um, weight categories if martial artists are going to go into competition. So that can um, unfortunately lead to disordered eating. And also women have across many societies, in fact, most societies, um, they experience quite strong feminine beauty ideals. And often these beauty ideals are based on achieving a certain weight. Um, in the West, for example, it's often a very slender figure. And so that combination of feminine beauty ideals alongside weight categories in sport can lead women and girls to be at increased risk of eating disorders, um, which can lead to things in the future, such as early onset osteoporosis, which is a bone density, a weakening of bone density, a very severe um, illness. So good practices, again, to avoid body shaming. We talked a bit about this when we're thinking about how we advertise our classes. So we maybe don't want to advertise our classes as for um, losing weight because that focus on the body can unintentionally um, lead to disordered eating practices, particularly amongst women. So avoiding body shaming, avoiding mentioning really practitioners' body weight, discouraging practitioners from trying to cut weight to fight within a lower weight category um, and emphasizing the importance of skill over weight and size. Now, other things we could have talked about here is about pregnancy, for example, pre and post and how women come back to sport after that. There's too much to talk about and so much to talk about. So not enough time today, but hopefully this gives a little bit of an indication of the ways in which um, sex does and doesn't matter for coaching women and girls. What is more important in terms of coaching women and girls really is the impact of gender. So ideas about um, how women and girls should be in society have much more prominent impact into women and girls' experiences within martial arts settings and how they um, overcome some of them. So a lot of the expectations Again, each culture has a specific set of ideas about what it is to be a woman um, and what that should involve. But some characteristics which tend to stretch across most cultures include that women should look pretty and friendly. And um, there's an expectation that women should be caring, that they should put others first and that they should take up little space and um, that they should really be quite small and make room for others. Now, these types of gendered expectations, um, which women might experience in lots of different areas of their life, come into conflict with some of the expectations of what we do in martial arts. So while society might want women to look pretty and friendly, in martial arts, we want them to show aggression. And um, while society wants women to be caring, in martial arts, we want them to hit people. When society wants uh, women to put others first. Martial arts want them to prioritise their time spent doing the martial art. And we can think here particularly about mothers and how mothers often prioritise children um, or their partners over spending time for themselves to dedicate time to engaging in a hobby for themselves. So often we see a big dip in women's participation in sport at the age that they might be a mother. And also um, expectations for women and girls to take up little space comes in direct contrast to what we want them to do in the martial arts settings, which is to move, to shout, to throw, 
um, to smell, to start sweating and smell quite bad. These are things which come into conflict with conventional expectations of what women and girls should be across a lot of different cultural settings. So when women and girls practice martial arts, I would argue that this and lots of research um, by my colleagues here on this call argues that it can actually be a very good experience for women and girls because there's space to move beyond what is expected of women and girls um, to engage in activities and practices um, which are not expected of women and girls, such as being aggressive learning to put themselves first, learning to take up space and be vocal about what they want to do. So practicing martial arts can challenge some parts of conventional ideas about what it is to be a woman. Um, and that can increase um, women's skill sets and increase the opportunities for them to live their lives and perform their lives as they might want to. So got a last slide here about mixed sex training versus women only training. So this is something to think about um, as a coach and as Anna alluded to in her previous um, set of slides as well. So I've put up some small set of arguments for either and I'm sure we'll have a good discussion about this at the end because it seems to be appearing a few times. So some arguments for mixed sex practice are that martial arts have a universal curriculum or a curriculum that both men and women are expected to do. We're expected to do the same thing, so why not train together? Other arguments include that it challenges men and women's assumption, assumptions about women's capacities and that therefore that is good for creating greater gender equality. And also that the segregation of women um, and men in martial arts can reinforce ideas of the women's classes as inferior to men's classes. Arguments for women-only practice is that women and girls can be put off by masculine stereotypes and therefore might not join a class if it's mixed sex only. So if you provide a women's only class, that might be the only way to get some women to join a martial art in the first place that these can be supportive spaces and they're experienced as supportive spaces by women um, for breaking gender stereotypes together. And also that survivors of male violence or some um, religious women might feel uncomfortable or unable to train with men. And therefore a women's only uh, coaching space provides a place where these women could train. So these are some considerations. I'm sure we'll come back to this discussion, but what is important in deciding whether it's mixed sex or single sex is thinking about the cultural context and what type of women you're targeting or wanting to introduce to your sport. So I'll stop sharing now um, and I look forward to sharing the discussion in with the colleagues. Thank you very much, Dr. McLean. Fantastic, fantastic presentation. There's a lot, you know, I think in such a short time, you address so many of the, of the, I guess, I would imagine the questions that come up for every coach, especially a male coach, when it comes to how to actually coach women and girls. Um, I'm so glad you, you know, address those, those conversations, which are often considered taboo, you know, especially the menstruation and menopause and even the eating disorders. It's really fantastic information uh, for anybody and even, you know, the social cultural context and, and the expectations that are on you know, women in society in general. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I'm wondering would any of the other panelists like to jump in if you have any comments or questions? Uh, anything you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, um, I, I completely agree. I think uh, the points you made, Chloe, about uh, biology, about menstrual cycle, um, it, uh, it really uh, needs more attention. Um, it should be integrated into coach education programs. It should be taken into consideration. Uh, when planning uh, training cycles, um, especially for elite athletes. Um, for instance, I've taken all the coach certifications nationally and internationally. There is nothing about um, women's biology, menstruation, 
injury prevention, these really important issues. Um, so um, I would expect that many martial arts education programs for coaches do not address these types of issues and therefore coaches do not have the knowledge they need to really um, help their female elite athletes especially reach um, the top levels they can. Yeah, really great point there, um, Dr. Chundal. And, and you know, what I heard as well, a lot of in, in what you shared, um, Dr. McLean, is really about creating the supportive environment. You know, the knowledge is power. So the more you, the more any coaches understands what their martial artists might be experiencing and, and to try and put themselves inside of their shoes, you know, with empathy, with that understanding, you can actually create a much more supportive environment that, it, that even comes back to the retention as well. You know, of course, if women feel included and they feel like they're, you know, they're understood, they're more likely to enjoy the experience and, and even if, if these considerations are considered as well, even be um, even more successful as well, I would imagine. So I'm, I'm conscious of the time and I, I think we had discussed that there's a potential we will go over time here. So we're probably going to go over the hour by about 15 minutes or so. And just for each of our attendees, just to let you know and be aware of that. And if you have to leave and drop off after the hour, you know, you can follow up with the recording. As I said, it will be on YouTube and we'll also be sending it out to you. Um, but I'm wondering, should, does anybody else have any other comments or questions here? Or should we move on to the next topic? In, in Let me add something just uh, very quickly. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you for the great presentation, Chloe. As I was listening to you, and uh, I was thinking of the coaching style, the importance also of the coaching style in creating the supportive environment, because I recently came across some research about the effects that different coaching styles had on uh, athletes or practitioners' motivation to continue, not only with their sport, but uh, also with education. For, for, it was a dual career uh, research, the one that I am talking about. And uh, the results were that the coaches that showed more effect in their coaching, in their coaching style were creating like uh, this, uh, were better creating this supportive environment. And it was like linked to athletes continuing with their practice. So like uh, educating coaches on how to show more uh, effect Fantastic. Yeah. Emotional intelligence, isn't it really? And that person centered approach um, and connecting, I suppose, connecting with, with your players. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for your input. And so this takes moves us to our next topic, which we're, which we're actually naturally, there's been a natural build up. We're, we're almost coming there naturally anyway, which is pathways for women in leadership. So coming back to you, Dr. Chindal, and your, all of your expertise on that in this, this domain. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Do you see yes. the presentation? Yeah. Okay, I'll try to to keep it to seven, eight minutes. Um, talking about pathways for uh, women in leadership roles. I have uh, three main themes or points that I would uh, like to, to bring to this webinar and to the discussion. Uh, the first is about policies and strategies. The second is about uh, the pitfalls and potentials of women-centered leadership programs, which ties into to both the presentation of Chloe and Alma. Uh, and the third point is on uh, the importance of men as change agents. So beginning with the most complex thing, <laughs> with policies and strategies, there are different uh, ways that martial arts and other sport organizations can go about making pathways for women in leadership roles. Um, some uh, other scholars, Jurid Hovden, Agnes Elling, and uh, Annelies Noppers, uh, who are uh, sports sociologists, they call two main approaches, the individual track and the structural track. And these two approaches um, that sport organizations often work under when they um, 
try to promote women in leadership. Uh, they are different in terms of framing the problem, in terms of policy aim, and in terms of strategy. So martial art clubs or other sport organizations within the individual track, they often see gender inequalities as an individual problem. And this means that they diagnose the problem uh, in a way that women as individuals lack resources and competence to compete with men on equal terms for leadership positions. Uh, sport organizations within the structural track, on the other hand, they think of gender inequalities as an organizational problem. And therefore, their diagnosis is that uh, informal and formal discrimination and processes of exclusion uh, are, is the main issue that limits uh, women's advancement in leadership. And these different understandings of what the problem is also lead to different uh, policy aims and strategies. In the individual track, sport organizations' uh, main goal is to recruit more women. But in the structural track, the policy aim is to ensure gender equality and fairness within the organization. And this means that strategies in the individual track, they are often centered around uh, the development of the individual woman, uh, while strategies in the structural track are centered or based on structural measures. Um, and a well-known example of this would be the introduction of gender quotas for leadership, uh, which Norway is quite uh, famous for. Uh, so, the individual track and the structural track, they represent two different approaches or ways of thinking about creating pathways for women in leadership roles uh, in martial arts and in other sport organizations. And these, uh, or this theoretical framing brings us into the second point, uh, which is um, women-centered leadership programs. Uh, this is a very well-used strategy uh, to advance women in leadership roles, such as coaching, management, board of directors, refereeing, and so on. And especially uh, in sport organizations that fall within the individual track. Uh, and despite the fact that these programs are often used as a strategy to recruit and develop women in sport leadership, there are several uh, pitfalls uh, with women-only programs. Um, the main one is that they often tend to reinforce gender stereotypes that women lack knowledge, skills, and competence. In other words, that they are not equal to men. They need something else, something extra, in order to compete with men for the leadership positions. A second pitfall is that they often overlook gendered hierarchies and power relations in the specific sport and the specific leadership role, for instance, coaching. So they tend to overlook the structural and organizational barriers that women face. And lastly, uh, many of these uh, women-centered leadership programs, uh, what happens is that after the program is finished, the number of women uh, drops down again. So, uh, they often struggle with retention. Uh, they might recruit more women into leadership for a short time, but then when the program ends, it's back to square one. However, there are many opportunities with these uh, types of programs, uh, of, of course, in addition to uh, allowing women to develop leadership skills, whether it be coaching or um, other management roles, uh, mainly, it gives women a community and, and a safe space where they can uh, share experiences as women leaders in martial arts. Uh, so it could be a good area to develop community and support among uh, women leaders. It's also a good way to educate uh, on the risks and challenges that many women leaders face in male-dominated sport organizations and leadership. So for new women coming into leadership roles for the first time, they might not be prepared uh, for some of the uh, cultural and structural barriers that they may face. And thirdly, uh, it can be a good platform to discuss uh, gendered power relations and gender distributions of uh, leadership tasks and other issues. 
So I just wanted to, to advertise Leanne Norman's new book uh, for those of you who are interested in coaching. It just came out earlier this month, Improving Gender Equity in Sport Coaching. It has several chapters from different sports uh, on, uh, on women-centered leadership programs in coaching. And uh, together with Jurid Hovden, I, I've written one chapter there evaluating uh, one of the uh, or one such program from, from uh, boxing coaches. So to the last point that I would like to make, uh, which is uh, on the importance of men as change agents. Um, if you take a look at this group photo on this slide, uh, it's, um, it's from my own uh, coach examination with the International uh, Boxing Federation. And I remember uh, going there, the instructor said uh, in all his years as an instructor, he had never seen so many women in a boxing coach certification course. And here we are three women and 15 men. So the point I, I want to make with this photo is if we are going to talk about pathways for women in leadership um, roles in martial arts, we have to talk about men. Men constitute the majority in almost all decision-making boards and committees in sport. This means that men play a key role in the advancement of gender diversity and democracy in sport leadership in the future. Any strategy to create change therefore requires that more men become involved in the drive to increase gender diversity in sport governance. Alliances of women with men are a necessity today and in the future to secure pathways for women in leadership roles, in martial arts, and in other sports. So for any aspiring women leaders in martial arts listening, I would, my tip would be find your male allies because you need them. <laughs> so I think I'll stop uh, there. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Chindal. And for all those men out there, I hope you're listening. I hope you're pulling up your socks. We women need you to support inclusion. Thank you so much for that presentation. Really fantastic. And I popped the link to that book, actually. I did a quick Google. So the link is in the chat as well uh, for anyone who's watching live. And I'll pop it at the end slide as well for anyone watching the recording. So I'm mindful of the time. So rather than coming in here, because I know, Dr. Tannen, you're going to pull everything together and summarize a lot of what we've said here. So are you ready? Would you like to jump in? Are you ready? Sure. Yeah, I'll uh, just share my screen. Thank you. Oh, pardon me. Um, Sorry, I just need to uh, jump back to the meeting. Okay, is, is the uh, single slide showing now? Uh, yes, I'm seeing tension between ideals, that, that slide. Lovely. Uh, okay, so as, as we've been talking, I've just scrolled down four sort of overarching points, which I think you might have got a spoiler on if, as I scrolled through and tried to bring it up there. Um, four points that I think should tie together most of what we've just been talking about. Um, the first point is that there is a generalized tension between ideals of femininity and martial arts practice, particularly, uh, even though this is going to vary by, by culture, uh, it's going to vary across generations, it's going to vary according to lots of different um, factors. What tends to be the case in most of the research that, that we have on this topic around the world is that there are um, various different contradictions, tensions, problems between uh, what women are supposed to do in society and what martial arts requires of them. And that's been touched on by, by each of the other three presenters. Um, the, the first sort of sub point there that I've put, you know, ignoring this is not going to resolve problems. So expecting women to, to turn up and just get on with it um, and, you know, integrate themselves into existing clubs, um, forge ahead with their leadership and coaching careers and so on, that's not going to resolve um, the issue. So gender shouldn't matter here it shouldn't be a, an issue for martial arts practice it shouldn't get in the way of people's career progression it shouldn't um, be a barrier to participation but it is in, in various different ways so we need to recognize that and i think 
um, to come back to, to um, Dr. Chundor's last point, um, men have to recognize this as well, particularly given that, uh, you know, and I speak as a man who's, who's lived this out, you know, for several years, it's not necessarily something that's a problem for us personally. It's not something that men um, have experienced. Um, certainly when we're dealing with uh, some of the issues that Dr. McLean talked about, uh, around um, you know, menstruation and uh, pregnancy and, and so on, um, these are issues obviously that we're never going to experience personally, um, but equally things to do with gender expectations. So we can't um, you know, expect these problems to go away without recognizing that they exist as a starting point and then proactively working to, uh, to try and reduce this tension. And that, um, you know, that proactive work is gonna be, it's gonna take various forms. We've heard quite a few already today of, of um, ways that we might move uh, forwards and try and overcome and tackle these boundaries, uh, these, these barriers rather, uh, and promote women and girls inclusion and, and um, success and, and excellence in martial arts. They're likely to be culturally specific the way we actually try and implement them. Uh, I think briefly, um, Dr. McLean mentioned uh, mixed sex training uh, as being potentially a, a problematic for some women, but being brilliant for others. So, you know, these things are not going to, these strategies that we use to overcome these problems aren't going to work all the time in every uh, every kind of um, situation. So recognizing that there is this tension and that we should take it seriously and do something about it, I think is the first um, sort of overarching point to take home here. Um, secondly, uh, women's specific needs deserve attention, very much connected to the first point really, but I really want to drive home this point that you know, if martial arts are generally seen as masculine activities, they're generally male dominated in most, um, you know, most clubs tend to have more men than women. Most of the time men are leading these clubs, uh, leading these generations. Um, when women enter these spaces, they shouldn't be just treated as honorary men, right? You're here with the men doing the men's thing. Welcome, be part of it, just get on with it kind of attitude. Uh, women have specific needs. They have uh, particular um, issues that need to be addressed. They have particular problems that men might not have. Um, and those need to be addressed in their own right uh, if women are going to succeed uh, and excel. Now, the, the final point on the slide, um, again, to, to sort of reiterate from the previous presentation, uh, male coaches probably haven't experienced these things personally themselves. They're likely to lack direct experience um, and, and to, you know, to empathise and to sort of um, guess at these things and to get out ahead of it just purely on their own merits is probably not going to happen. So a great thing for, for federations, for uh, bodies that develop sport in various different countries, is to think about coach education and think about placing these kinds of issues, female specific problems, gender issues that men are not likely to have experienced, placing these firmly within the coach education curricula, as well as that, um, which we'll come on to in just a moment, the increasing prominence of women in leadership positions so that women are making decisions and are part of the uh, the process for tackling these issues rather than always having it being left up to the men uh, is going to be very helpful and very useful. So acknowledging that women have specific needs in these kind of uh, contexts that need to be taken seriously um, is quite important in with respect to meeting the first point. Um, thirdly, as I mentioned the first time I, I chipped in, um, representation and this sort of connects quite nicely with the recruitment of women but also um, around things like media representation of, of uh, female athletes. So uh, for federations that are trying to promote um, audiences for, um, you know, their, for their, their, their female fighters and so on, think about how we can represent women in martial arts in a genuine and authentic way that centers on, uh, as I've put there, girls and women's actual experiences. So not a male image of what female martial arts is supposed to look like, not a man's idea of women in martial arts, but actually what women themselves want to say want to want to see um, in order to you know accurately represent them but also to to encourage and motivate others to to join and, and take part um, and they should also be aspirational so uh, images that and, and you know representations of women in martial arts that center on um, the uh, the ambitions held by girls and women for their development um, you know as, as we've talked about with those other points as well so representation, very important in terms of communicating a positive uh, and, and forward thinking developmental message about what martial arts can be uh, in girls and women's lives. Uh, and lastly, really just, just to sort of, um, as, as Dr. Chendal was talking, I already had this written down and she's mentioned all of these points. So just to reiterate them really, um, women being in, uh, in leadership positions, having ownership, being able to direct things, being able to place these issues very firmly on the agenda, 
rather than um, you know, leaving it up to the men all the time, men in these positions of power need to recognize that women should be part of this conversation. It's very important that we um, proactively help women ourselves, but also give them space, give them a voice, give them um, you know, a hand on the steering wheel. Let's get more than just you know, three out of 15 um, you know, people on a, on a coaching course. Let's get to a, to a position where women are actually uh, able to solve these problems on, um, on behalf of other women and girls. Um, particularly when it comes to the, the topics we've talked about today, I think recruiting, retaining and coaching women to recognize those specific unique issues uh, that men are likely to have never encountered. Um, the final point that I, I would sort of close on, um, women's voices in policy is very important, but one thing to think about if, if anyone from, from any um, you know, club, federation and so on is, is here, um, women have more to say than just things about gender and things about women and girls inclusion. Um, one of the most frustrating things about gender inclusion policies is that they um, tend to be written in response to a directive from a larger body. So a, a funding body will say, you need to have a gender policy. So if you go and you write a gender policy and the gender inclusion policy is separate from and different to all of the other policies and it's written on its own, on its own terms and its own little space. If the perspective that informs that policy isn't um, represented in other things that your federations and your clubs are doing, then you're likely to have tensions between the goals of that policy to improve access for women and girls and all the other things that are already being done and have been done uh, by your federation. So, you know, having women in these positions of leadership is very important, not just in terms of answering the, the, the gender question, but also making sure that the rest of what we're doing in martial arts is, is facilitating that and is conducive to, um, to, rep to good representation, to increased, uh, um, you know, accessibility and, and so on and so on. So those are my sort of four um, take home, um, hopefully useful and, uh, and helpful to sort of tie everything together. Um, and I think I can stop talking now. I think that is an absolutely beautiful summary. Very, very well said. You know, I'm so inspired by this conversation. I'm actually covered in goosebumps all throughout. So thank you so much, um, Dr. Channon, for that lovely summary and to each of our panelists. Uh, and there's, you know, there's comments in the chats about, you know, so many people love really loving your presentations. So thank you each. Um, there is a question here. Uh, I know we're at the 15 minutes, or, you know, we're gone over. But there is a quick question. I'm just wondering, can we take it? It's from Stephanie Stevens. Uh, oh, yeah, she said, actually, it's more for the Q&A, the final Q&A session. So we'll leave that for there, Stephanie. And thank you for the question. I'm, I'm going to save that. Um, so just as we are talking about the Q&A session, so the final session of the whole webinar series, the 10th session, it's a live Q&A is on September the 7th from 1 to 2 p.m. Universal time. And so we have some very speakers from the different panels who have sat throughout. And I just want to say, as we bring this webinar, webinar nine to a close, I really, from the bottom of my heart, really want to thank each of our panelists once again, uh, Dr. Kavura, Dr. McLean, Dr. Chandal, and Dr. Channon. Obviously we couldn't be here without you. And each of your presentations were so full, packed full of information for such short presentations. There was a lot in there to cover. Uh, that you all that you each covered and i'm so grateful and thank you for being with us so as i said there you can connect with each of our panelists on twitter they're all all of their twitter handles are in the chat and they'll also be on the final slide if you're watching the recording i also wish to thank each of our attendees for joining us and for your engagement for your comments throughout we're so happy to see such interest in this conversation of inclusion. It's really you know, because there's a wider movement. It's not just in martial arts, you know, the whole sports sector. There's this real drive at the moment for inclusion. And so it's so happy to see, to feel the, the movement is alive. You know, I think that's the goosebumps I'm feeling is like there's an, this movement is alive and it's, it's happening through each of us. So thank you each and everybody. And of course, thank you UNESCO ICM for facilitating this in collaboration with us here at the UNESCO chair. So with that being said, thank you again, once again to everybody. And we wish you such a wonderful, wonderful day. And yeah, maybe our paths will all cross again on our journey towards inclusive practice. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, bye-bye.